I want you to imagine yourself on a battleship. And not just any battleship. The newest battleship ever built. You're picturing clean steel, freshly scrubbed decks, a well-organized crew, making sure that everything's in working order. That's how it should be. Instead, imagine these brand new ships caked in coal dust, fouled with seaweed and barnacles, and with a crew constantly verging on mutineering. In addition, completely unbeknownst to you, one of your admirals has died several days ago and is now being kept in cold storage below deck. And you haven't seen a day of combat yet. This story is the tragic conclusion to an 18,000-mile-long journey around the world. This is the story of history's most disastrous voyage. Hello and welcome to History's Most, Episode 3, History's Most Disastrous Naval Voyage, Part 2, The Battle of Tsushima. If you haven't listened to Part 1, um, we would really strongly recommend you go back and yes. listen to it, not just because it kind of sets the context for this battle, but because it is a hell of a good story, mm-hmm. and you're really missing out. Um, we're going to give a very brief overview just to get you up to speed uh, for those people who've listened to episode one so this is during the russo-japanese war the port arthur incident which uh, if you don't know about that is uh the japanese basically destroy a good amount of the russian pacific fleet so the Tsar assembles a fleet to go eighteen thousand miles around the world essentially to Japan from the Baltic fleet or from or from the Baltics uh, this does not go well they they the have to say there's a few hiccups along the way yeah <laughs> they uh, they accidentally open fire on uh, British fishing trawlers mistaking them for Japanese torpedo boats in the North Sea they uh, have many different issues with refueling. Uh, They spend a good amount of time in a lovely little place called Hellville in uh, Madagascar, which is every bit as lovely as it sounds. And finally, in May 1905, they've been at sea for eight months, roughly. A little bit longer. (laughs) They are in the Pacific. They're approaching Japan. And we pick up the story with the fleet assembled, both the the second Pacific Squadron under a guy called Rosadvensky and the the rust buckets, the so-called self sinkers, <laughs> under Nebogatov, are uh, in French Indochina, modern day Vietnam. They are about to enter one of the well, pretty much the battle of the Russo-Japanese War, and. Are they prepared? I would say, on balance, no. (laughs) Yeah. Now, are the Japanese prepared? Yes. Togo, the admiral commanding the Japanese fleet, is he's a real student of naval history. He models himself on the hero Admiral Nelson. Um, He has been waiting for a long time. He's got plans in place. He's not got unlimited coal, just like the Russians, so he isn't going to sail down into the Pacific to meet them. He's very much biding his time, keeping his fleet safe near Japan and ready to strike. And so, what are the kind of, like, main... I guess, what are the the types of ships? Like, we're, we're going up against, like, designs here. So, yeah. obviously, the Russian fleet, not only are they, you know, th- these are brand new ships. Uh, the crew's inexperienced. And of, of course, I say they're brand new. You wouldn't know it by looking at them after this eight-month-long journey right. because they're caked 
in soot and seaweed and all bunch of different stuff, which is going to have an impact uh, on speed, obviously on crew morale as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to have a direct impact on that, that battle. Yeah, the Russians have uh, five Borodino class battleships, which are brand new. They're the newest battleships in the world. Mm. They four of them came with Orzevetsky. His flagship is one of them, the Turov. Um, another one has come with uh, Nebogatov's fleet. It was not quite ready yet mm. to leave uh, in October of 1904. And these are, you know, big, powerful ships. Um, they have considerable firepower. They've got thick armor. But the crews are totally inexperienced. They're mostly brand new recruits. The ships haven't undergone really much in the way of sea trials. Mm. Uh, they also have something called the uh, tumble home hull design, which the hull kind of goes out in the middle, right. um, which is possibly a contributing factor to their instability. We'll learn about soon. And for reasons that remain totally unclear, um, the funnels are painted bright yellow. Oh, okay. Which makes it much easier to uh, basically target. Yeah, spot them using target finders. Uh, that's an interesting choice. I wonder what the the rationale behind that was. It's um, generally pretty mysterious. I'm not not been able to find out why that was done. I I wonder actually because of the of how caked they are in um, in in you know weeds and all this. Do you think there's a degree of camouflage there? Do you think that might give them a slight <laughs> advantage? <laughs> I think any advantage of the camouflaging is offset when you take the... into account the speed <laughs> that is lost. Yeah. The interval would be about one knot slower than the Japanese ships because of the fact they're so overloaded. Mm. They're also so low down in the water because they're overloading, but also actually Russian ships invariably were completed. Uh, they ended up heavier than intended. Mm. It means that uh, the thickest part of your armor was actually submerged on a number of these ships. So it wasn't serving any purpose. So that defeats the point of the armor. <laughs> right. And also some of them were, were really overloaded. Secondary batteries, which were kind of mini smaller guns, often six inch guns um, along the sides of the ship uh, some of them were so close to the water that they were inoperable um, mm. so they're not in a great state, the Russian ships at this point, but on the other hand they aren't, you know, they aren't for the most part, at least the new battleships, they're not rust buckets, they're not useless yeah um, they're not massively inferior to the Japanese ships. The greatest problem is going to be the crew's kind of battle readiness. Yeah. Now, they they essentially had no time to train before they left on this voyage. They had to do a lot of their training on the actual voyage itself. And Yeah, the newer battleships, the crews hadn't really had a chance to do any trials or training. Yeah. And the, as we heard last episode, the efforts train during the voyage were pretty disastrous yeah uh they didn't they didn't fare very well so they're going into the their first naval battle essentially i mean this this is not only their maiden voyage but also it's the first time the the whole ending of this is going to be combat and it's combat that these men are vastly unprepared for you can't really think of a worse situation to be going into a major battle yeah. from, can you? Um, you know, eight months at sea, eight grueling months at sea oh, yeah. after the longest voyage. And even if you had, it had been massively successful and well planned, after eight months at sea, the longest ever voyage, you know, you wouldn't be in a great place going into this battle. Yeah. But it's it's not been perfect, as you will have learned in the last episode. Um. The ships are filthy, the crews are demoralised, there's only been bad news from home and from the war, there's been minor mutinies, drunkenness is rife, and even now there is still daily suicides for these ships. Jeez. Daily? Yeah. Wow. 
So, we've talked about the Russians. Let's talk about the Japanese a little bit here. Yeah, we've not really talked so much about the Japanese. Uh, we mentioned last time their battleships were built in, in England. Um, mm. And if you think about England in the late 19th, early 20th century, it's the world's leading maritime power. So the battleships that Japan has, uh, they're built in some of the kind of finest shipyards in the world, uh, not, e- not least from my, in my native Newcastle. Mm-hmm. Um, and although they don't have many battleships, uh, Togo's uh, main squadron consists of six. They, they are of high quality. And what's even more important is the quality of his crews. Yeah, I was going to ask about the... Because the, the Russians are just completely inexperienced, as we said. The Japanese... What What is it like for them? Because, I mean, for the Russians, this is a lot of, you know, the, this is the first time they're really seeing any combat. What What is the Japanese experience like as, you know, just a regular sailor? Well, Japan, as we said last time, is a seafaring nation. It's an island. There were seafaring communities... A significant number of the crews are volunteers and not conscripts. Mm. They want to serve in the Navy. Um, relations between the officers and the men are kind of respectful, whereas in the Russian fleet, uh, it's generally very poor. The officers in the Russian Navy generally use pretty harsh uh, corporal punishment, for example. Mm. Don't really know the men. The opposite is true with the Japanese fleet. Um, the Japanese officers are generally well trained based on um, British methods and um, additionally these Japanese crews have generally seen combat the Japanese fleet has been in action several times already right. in the Russo-Japanese war fighting um, the Russian Pacific Squadron mm. uh, operating out of Port Arthur the biggest battle being the Battle of the Yellow Sea so they've already actually had a made um, and you know, not to mention as well, at the top of it all, Togo is a very competent officer and probably regarded, you know, as one of the finest kind of Japanese admirals in history. Yeah. Whereas, um, to quote um, Robert Forsyak, um, Brozovetsky is, in his words, or was in his words, a screaming imbecile of a commander. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very powerful words. So at every level, um, in terms of you know the ordinary crewmen, the officers, the Japanese have an advantage, and they've had more experience. They've had more time to train and drill and carry out firing exercises. This all means that basically uh, the Japanese crews are able to achieve a, a rate of fire during this coming battle, which is about twice that of the Russians. Right. And I'm going to assume that they're able to pretty much outmaneuver and outspeed um, the Russian fleet as well. There's no comparison in terms of the speed, but more important, um, they're able to pull off some maneuvers in this battle that um, the Russians really couldn't dream of, and, and the lack of the lack of seamanship and organization among the Russian fleet is going to is going to cost them dear. Right. One point actually that I haven't uh, mentioned as well. Um, it's kind of a niche point, but the range finders, um, the kind of technical opt- optics mm. used to uh, basically sight and target enemy ships. Um, the Japanese ships are carrying uh, Bar and Stroud range finders, which were developed in 1903, so they're brand new. Mm. Whereas the Russian ones are from the uh, 1880s mostly, and provide far less accurate targeting wow. is going to be important yeah I can see that um, the Japanese I, I assume that you know it's got a lot to do with them being built in Britain um, they're they're kind of technologically more more ready yeah I mean I would say that the technological difference is significant than the kind of manpower difference in terms of quality. Yeah. Um, 
if you'd put Japanese crews in the Russian ships, would it have been the other way around? I'm not sure. Mm. Um, but I would say that the you know the Russian fleet, for all its problems, you know they've got these Borodino class ships, which are brand new. Yeah. Which, you know, are the most up to date battleships on the planet. So it's not like other than the rust buckets mm-hmm. um, of the third Pacific Squadron. It's not like the Russians are going into it without a prayer in terms of the actual quality of the of the ships they're saying. Right. So uh right. So where do they where does this begin? Where does where does the battle actually start? What is what is yeah. the beginning? So they leave um Camran, um right in uh, mid May nineteen oh five, the Russian fleet combined second and third Pacific squadrons and already there's a problem Mm. Rosetvensky probably would have preferred to take what's considered the safe route which is to go way in a big loop east of Japan and Mm. up around the north of it to go to Vladivostok just get to port you know you'd be safe there we can kind of clean the ships, recall, you know, the crew can finally kind of have some rest. But by mistake, the battleship Alexander III only loaded 300 tonnes of coal at Camran, which was going to be nowhere near enough to take this safe route. Yeah. How did they manage to do that? (laughs) I genuinely have no idea. Especially as the Alexander the Third had been winning the, you know that Rosetvensky had been putting up for the quickest coaling, mm. some sort of administrative error. I really don't know. Um, but what it does mean is that the Russian fleet is now going to have to pass through the Straits of Tsushima and take the kind of short route between Korea and Japan to get up to Vladivostok because Port Arthur's now in in Japanese hands, so that they they have to get up to Vladivostok. Right. And this is a big problem because the Straits of um, Tsushima are only thirty miles across. Yeah. So their chances of going undetected are, you know, next to none. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is about the this, this width of the English Channel. Um, it's going to be very tough for them yeah. to avoid the Japanese, which at the minute is now their primary. Right, and like you said earlier, the. The range finders on these Japanese ships are much more, are much greater than um, than the the capabilities of the Russian ships. So they're going to be able to see them a lot earlier, isn't it? They're certainly going to be able to target them um, more accurately at longer range. Yeah. Um, but Turgo had realized in the previous uh, clash, the Battle of the Yellow Sea, that to really kind of finish off an enemy fleet, he was going to have to get closer. Mm. Um, he was going to have to bring into play uh, his secondary guns as well as the big heavy 12-inch guns. Um, so he took on his strategy for the coming battle. It was going to be quite aggressive. Um, and that, I think, took the Russians somewhat by surprise. So the Russian fleet is, is, is making as quick as they can for uh, Vladivostok. And mm-hmm. as I mentioned in the previous episode, um, Rostovetsky's, uh, Rostovetsky's second in command, Admiral Fulkasam, suffered a stroke uh, in mid May. Mm-hmm. But he hadn't let that news out. Now, on the 26th of May, um, Fulkasam actually dies. Right. But he, um, Rostovetsky, opts not to inform the fleet and also not to inform the crew of uh, his battleship which is the Oslia Bia okay now Rosovetsky split his fleet now into what's called three divisions uh, three groups of um, kind of ships hmm. so first divisions under himself um, with four of the Borodino class battleships second division is technically under Felkasau, but he's dead, huh. um, with three battleships and an armoured cruiser. And then there's the third division, which is made up of the 
the rust buckets, the self sinkers, um, with one Borodino class under Nebogatov. Now, Nebogatov, as I mentioned last time, is, is unaware of the fact that Felkazam is out of the picture. Um, he's totally unaware now that he's second. So if anything happens to Rosovensky, he is supposed to take over, but he doesn't know that. <laughs> so that's not exactly a great start. No. That night, the night of the 26th, 27th, they're sailing through the Straits of Tushimina, and there's a, they hope that there's some luck on their side because there's really dense fog. Yeah. This could be exactly what they need to kind of sneak through undetected. Um, but unfortunately, um, about two o'clock in the morning, the 27th, the only um, ship in their fleet that still has its lights on is spotted by a Japanese cruiser. Oh, it's a hospital ship. Now, under the rules of war, uh, hospital ships apparently do have to keep their kind of lights on. They can't sneak around. Right. I so, mean, I'm not one to advocate breaking the rules. Yeah. But maybe in this case, <laughs> I mean, they'd already gone 18,000 miles. I mean, they, they're they're making, they're, their whole goal is to get to Vladivostok, where they can just have a nice rest. I mean, for th- you, you can do it. You can, you can turn off your lights for that amount of time. I mean, Right, but they don't. Yeah. <laughs> I would have done. I would have done. I'll be honest. Yeah, but they don't. Um, not only that, but the hospital ship mistakes the Japanese cruiser in the fog for a friendly ship and actually signals to her um, friendly vessels nearby, just to remove any doubts from the Japanese cruiser as to whether they found the Russian fleet. Right, um, and the hospital ship, given that it thinks it's just seen a friendly ship doesn't inform any of the fleet commanders oh. um, of this sighting. So the cruiser signals back to Togo, who gets his fleet moving in kind of like the early hours of the 27th of May. Right. Now It's really uh, beginning now. Yeah. We're going to get into the battle. And I would recommend probably at this point to follow the action, it might be useful to get a map. Naval maps are quite confusing. Um, we'll kind of do our best to explain, but certainly we'll be able to tell you the kind of the details as they happen. We'll do our best to kind of sh- work out, you know, who's where. Mm-hmm. So, first of all, some of the cruisers that are a bit lighter cruisers appear to the Russians. The order from Rosyvensky is not to fire, but the poor discipline of the fleet is given away by the fact some of the ships do open fire. Right. About 1.40 p.m. on the 27th of May, 1905, the two battle fleets spot each other. And Togo moves in. Um, He attempts, he basically looks to overtake um, the Russians. For reasons, well, basically Rosovensky makes a mistake. He decides at this moment that the first and second divisions should combine into a single battle line. Hmm. Um, this is the first major real fleet battle for a hundred years, um, and the tactics remain kind of that that you would have seen a hundred years before, which is get into a big line, get yeah. all the battleships in a big line. Um, and kind of combine their firepower. Basically, though, the poor seamanship and signalling of the Russian fleet means there's a lot of confusion approaching. They're still trying to sort out their line. Mm. Um, And it ends up with uh, the kind of first division battleships a little bit... um, So it's less of a line and more of a... There's kind of almost two lines. They're not really in proper formation. Yeah. Um, now Togo doesn't want to engage the Borodino class ships of the first division head on. He doesn't want to go head to head with these ships, so he carries out quite a bold maneuver where he um, 
pivots his fleet so that uh, his ships can fire their full kind of broadside into the Russian line, whereas the Russian line can all, only fire forward-facing guns. You see right. I mean? um, like I said, if after the episode you can get like a naval or something like that, you can Google and kind of see the position of the ships, you might be able to visualize it. Now, basically, the firing starts. Now, this is the first time that kind of modern battleships, by which I mean kind of steel um, ships that we'd almost recognize today as ships, unlike, you know, sail-powered ships, yeah. um, clash in a major fleet battle. So we're going to see a real mix of the old and the new. Hmm. Um in terms of new technology, but almost old attitudes. Yeah. Um, the Japanese officers kind of model themselves on, like we've talked about before, almost the British heroes of old, which is kind of just standing on the deck and ignoring the fire around you <laughs> to kind of give a good example to your men. Togo is um, wounded during the battle, but he insists that... Uh, he's going to stay in the conning tower, which is like an armoured tower of the bridge. Yeah. Um, Because, and I quote, I'm getting on for 60, and this old body of mine is no longer worth caring for. (laughs) Um, Wow. So we're going to see some quite kind of almost 19th century um, kind of ideas clash with 20th century technology. Yeah, which... Yeah, you can't really do that. Um, you kind of need to think a little bit more, but, I mean, he gets away with it. <laughs> yeah, so the, one of the reasons we've got um, as clear an account as we do of the battle, um, I mean, it isn't that clear, but this is going to be absolute chaos for the next hour or so, um, is because there was a Royal Navy captain uh, called Captain Packenham, mm. Um, who was on board the Japanese battleship Azahai um, in this line of battle. And he orders a deck chair, uh, (laughs) and he sets it up on the quarter deck. He uh, has a monocle in one eye, telescope to the other, immaculately dressed, trim beard and (laughs) moustache. And he sits and watches on behalf of the Royal Navy uh, to report back. Um, and he just sits there and the only time he he gets off deck even when the shells are landing around flying human fragment which apparently was a piece of jaw uh, lands on him and he briefly uh, goes down deck below deck but reappears in an immaculate fresh white uniform and sits back on his deck chair (laughs) so he's been hit hit with a piece of someone's jaw and he's just like alright my suit has been dirtied. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the things that fascinates me is going to be just what happens to these ships that take years to build. Yeah. You know, these great metal monsters when they come into contact with shells and just the absolute horror that it must have been to be on board some of these ships. Mm-hmm. So... Let's get into it, shall we? Yeah. The firing starts, and the lead uh, ship, Togo ship, the Mikasa, is hit uh, about 15 times in five minutes by the Russians. The accuracy is actually pretty good. Um, But doesn't cause any kind of significant damage, I'm sure, you know, fair few casualties, but the ship's still fine. Mm Mm-hmm. We're now at about kind of ten past two in the afternoon. Um, the Japanese fleet has completed its turn, so they're now kind of running uh, parallel to the Russians, and they open fire. They target uh, the leading Russian battleships. Um, I'll, 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 I want to quote from you. Um, I'm going to quote him a few times. This is a Russian officer um, who was on board uh, Rosovetsky's flagship, the Surov. Mm. This Russian officer 
describes describes what it's like to come under fire for the first time during the battle. He says, splinters whistled through the air, jingled against the side and the superstructure, then quite close and abreast of the foremost funnel rose a gigantic pillar of smoke, water and flame. The next shell struck the side of the centre six-inch turret. There was a tremendous noise behind and below me on the port quarter. Smoke and tongues of fire leapt out of the officer's gangway. A shell, having fallen into the captain's cabin and having penetrated the deck, had burst in the officer's quarter, setting them on fire. The um, Japanese, at the kind of longer range, deployed Mm. high-explosive shells. And right. they targeted the superstructure, the kind of upper part. Yeah, the main the ships. kind of bulk of the upper deck. Yeah, the stuff that kind of comes up out of the deck. Yeah. If you like. The kind of bit that's almost like buildings built on top of the ship. And these high explosive shells are pounding the these Russian uh, leading battleships and sending shrapnel in all directions, starting fires. Whereas the Russians are firing armor penetration shells which um, you know obviously are targeted at trying to put holes in the enemy ship yeah, um, and kind of penetrate right into the, the heart of the ships mm, give them water before logs. detonating yeah, yeah. Um, and it turns out that probably the, the Japanese strategy was basically a superior one mm. in a very short space of time they begin achieving a huge amount of hits because like I said their rate of fire is about twice that of the Russian ships and you have these high explosive shells raining down on the Russian fleet and it causes absolute um, havoc now the first ship uh, to succumb the first casualty of the battle is the Orsliabia which is the ship that um Admiral um, Phil Kassan hmm. is, um, is currently in cold storage in um, <laughs> and there's a torrent of kind of high explosive shells coming down on it, it knocks out the main turret, uh, most of its secondary guns are taken out um, and after only about 15 minutes of combat um, it's in a really bad shape Right. a couple of heavy shells tear into uh, the hull around the waterline on the port uh, bow so the front of the ship um, on the left to use kind of layman's terms and obviously that leads to flooding yeah this thing is not staying you know up for very long no um now, according to um, an officer who was on the ship, he claimed that um, three armor-piercing shells then struck in this spot uh, where there'd been a breach in the right. waterline. He described it as not a hole, but a gateway. Um, so water is absolutely flooding Jeez. in. And the forward movement of the ship because it's in the bow in the front of the ship Mm. is is bringing more water in the captain um, makes a really serious error he thinks oh right okay we're taking it on the port side I'll have to balance it out so he floods um, the starboard magazine he deliberately takes water into the starboard side to try and balance it out capsizing but this is not a good idea no, because it basically means the bow is even heavier yeah. sinking into the water. So the front of the ship is beginning to uh, kind of move further, sink further and further down into the water. He's, the the Ospilibia has had to pull out of the line of battle. It's chugging along, heavily weighed down. And it basically, at about quarter past three, is the first ship to go down at Cat Sands. Mm. Um and it's the first time a steel battleship has been sunk by enemy fire. Yeah. And you can imagine on the Russian ships watching this happen, 
you know, watching one of these massive great ships that you've sailed all around the world with, yeah. um, just capsize, <laughs> turn upside down, what effect is that going to have? Yeah, on your morale. Well, their their hearts must have been sinking like the ship that they're watching. Absolutely. Um, even you know the Royal Navy observed called it a terrible spectacle. You know, it must have been really shocking to see. Yeah. Um. So it's clear that this kind of gunnery duel is only going one way. Um, the Japanese increasingly close in, and as they Gap also use some armor piercing shots that are, are, are kind of we're talking about ranges of less than about five kilometers now, uh-huh. so pretty sh- pretty close for a major kind of fleet engagement. And they are um, both kind of piercing the enemy's holes, and also, like we've said, these high explosive shells are causing. Fires to break out. Yeah. Um, I just want to read you a quote here from the same uh, Russian officer on the effect that the high explosive shells were having. Um, now, like I said, they had double the rough fire rate, and these these shells were just tearing apart the superstructure, hmm. causing fires, causing casualties. Wouldn't necessarily sink a ship. But what you're doing is, you know, you are... You're killing the crew, essentially. Killing the crew, yeah. you're taking out of operations different functions, you're taking out guns. Um, and this is worth quoting at length uh, from Semenov. Shells seem to be pouring upon us incessantly, one after another. It seemed as if that these were mines, not shells, which were striking the ship's side and falling on the deck. They burst as soon as they touched anything, the moment they encountered the least impediment in their flight. Handrails, funnel guys, topping lifts of the boat's derricks were quite sufficient to cause a thoroughly efficient burst. The steel plates and superstructure on the upper deck were torn to pieces, and the splinters caused many casualties. Iron ladders were crumpled up into rings, and guns were literally hurled from their mountings. Such havoc would never be caused by the simple impact of the shell still less by that of its splinters it could only be caused by the force of the explosion in addition to this there was the unusual high temperature and liquid flame of the explosion which seemed to spread over everything and he talks as well about he, he claims that a steel plate was literally catching fire huh. um, he's saying like the steel not necessarily but the paint on the side of the ship was catching fire such was the kind of temperature of these showers exploding and the fires they created. Um, it's a really graphic account, and this is what I'm saying in terms of, you know, what a horrible place to be, what a horrible experience. Um, uh-huh. He talks as well about the the kind of experienced crews and their reaction to being under fire like this. So obviously, one of the main jobs of the crews in this situation. But again, they've never been in combat before. Imagine what I've just described happening to you. And um, Semenov says, The stupor which seems to come over men who have never been in action before when the first shells begin to fall. Mm. The men at the fire mains, poses, stood as if mesmerized, gazing as the smoke and flame, not understanding apparently what was happening. I went down to them from the bridge, and with the most commonplace words, wake up, turn the water on, got them to pull themselves together and bravely fight the fire. But apparently, on board the Suvorov, the flagship fleet, the shells were just taking out the fire kind of crews. They were ripping the hoses to shreds, mm. the splinters. And um, up in the conning tower, which, like I said, is the tower above the bridge. It's supposed to be armoured, so as the bridge has got big glass windows, the bridge of the ship, where the commanders are supposed to be, yeah. it's not a safe place. Not a safe place once the shells start running. So, another flaw in the Russian design seems to be that conning t- the narrow slits uh, for looking out mm-hmm. um, were too wide, and right. shrapnel 
you know, fragments were, were flying in there. Mm-hmm. And he oh, says, man, I can, I can imagine. Can you imagine? Yeah. To the officers up there, he says, another shell exploded of the drummer who had been on duty there, not left, but a headless and legless trunk. Shell splinters flew through the loopholes. Steersman Proikus, who was at the wheel, was killed outright. Staff officers and ship's officers were wounded. Wow. Really grim. Yeah. Really grim. Um, and imagine as well, Rosovetsky is up there with these narrow kind of portholes to look out with potentially shrapnel flying through them. Apparently couldn't actually see what was going on on his own ship, never mind with the fleet. Mm. So he couldn't really look around at the kind of fires holding. And at this point, um, Rosovetsky himself is, is wounded. A shell fragment penetrates his skull, enters his brain. Oh. And basically he was um, increasingly incapacitated by this wound and it became clear he, he was not going to be a fleet. Mm. So he is taken off the ship as it's in a worse and worse state and taken lowered down on this improvised kind of um, stretcher made out of, I think, just hammocks and rope. Mm. And a torpedo boat, a Russian torpedo boat, pulls up alongside on the kind of rise of the ocean. They basically drop him in, <laughs> and he's transferred to a destroyer where he's he, he's not dead, but he's 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 out of action. Yeah. Um, so the Savorov is now in real dire straits. It's evacuated. There's one brave officer left on board, um, but there's fires. There's you know, part, guns are being. Um, ripped to shreds and eventually it's um, it's penetrated by armor piercing shells as well the smoke stocks set fire unsurprisingly um, it turns sharply kind of out of control out of the battle line um, and it's basically left crippled and is eventually uh, sunk yeah. as well. So that's two down. And one of the other um, really horrific aspects of the battle, when these steam-powered ships get hit, like in the engine rooms, in mm -hmm. the boiler rooms, um, you know, water pipes burst and steam, you know, and... and boiling obviously boiling hot steam that's what steam is but yeah. huge clouds of, of, of steam are released into the room and all those men sweating away in the engine rooms and shoveling the coal just get scalded and some of them you know literally scalded to death by just a huge cloud of boiling hot water coming towards you I mean that must have been utterly I can't terrifying begin to imagine that I mean being scalded to death I, this, that, this, these were not safe things to work on, really, were they? No, and I mean, to come all that way around the world yeah. for for that to happen, horrific. The other <laughs> Russian battleships are obviously not in great shape either. Yeah. Um, in particular, fires are kind of engulfing them. And it's clear that the... Um, the fleet is beginning to beginning to disintegrate um, Togo regroups his fleet um, and then moves in once again there's a kind of about a two hour pause uh -huh. um, from that point and then he moves back in to, to take on um, the rest of the fleet now remember the second in command Nebogatov doesn't know he's second in command yeah, I, so he I, hasn't taken over. I keep forgetting that they've they neglected to mention that to him. So he hasn't taken over, um, and the fleet is in really bad shape. It's 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 not no longer. It's it's kind of adopted almost like a herd mentality. It's just trying to survive. Yeah, there's no kind of tactics being employed. 
Um, the um, Alexander the Third is hit badly, um, and basically, all of a sudden, at about six thirty, keels over, just rolls over, and mm. um, reportedly no survivors wow. out of an eight hundred man crew. The um, Borodino um, is on fire, um, and at about half, about an hour later, about half seven, Togo signals to cease fire and to withdraw. Obviously, his ships have taken quite a battering too, but not to the same extent. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the Fuji, one of the Japanese battleships has already loaded its gun so fires off one last salvo as it kind of pulls away mm-hmm. and it turns out to be a complete lucky shot um, it penetrates uh, the Borodino um, explodes a magazine of ammunition wow. which sets off a series of explosions um, and once again uh, we'll go to Pakenham, who says that it produced the sensation of the day, an immense column of smoke ruddied on its underside by the glare of the explosion, and from the fire abaft, spurted to the height of her funnel tops. Um, there was only left a dense cloud that brooded over the place she had occupied. So basically it, it disappears in smoke and explosions, it very, very rapidly capsizes, and there is one survivor from that wow. battleship, the Borodino. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was the flagship. That was, um, that, I mean, wasn't it? That was the lead ship of yeah. this new Borodino class. Yeah. The um, Savorov was Rovetsky's um, oh, right. flagship. But basically, these new, these brand new battleships um, the Borodino class uh, there's only um, a couple of them left afloat yeah. um, three of them are sank so the fleet is, is, is fallen to bits and Togo knows the battle's won and he basically unleashes his destroyers and torpedo boats to hunt down the rest of the fleet which is basically making a run for it mm. uh, through the night because it's kind of Knights drawing in, and basically this um, just a sad story, really, of of the different ships being hunted down um, through the evening and night by um, the uh, by the these torpedo boats and destroyers. Nemegatov finally realizes it. He signals, follow the admiral, and tries to lead off the rest of the fleet. Mm. Um, he's got a handful of kind of um, uh, battleships left and a few a few kind of cruisers um, and the next day um, Togo engages them again at long range um, mm. realising the game's up uh, Nabogatov surrenders the 28th of May which apparently rather takes by surprise uh, Togo kind of raised in the Japanese culture of yeah no never surrender. surrender yeah one or two ships either kind of sail off on their own and try and make it and don't surrender or um, sail off to kind of neutral ports where they're interred um, but effectively that's the end and the remaining ships are taken away by the Japanese mm. And that's the end of the battle. And the end of the the voyage. That's, I mean, I mean, it, it is amazing, just the sheer amount of time, money, resources, coal, effort. I mean, put everything, everything, put into and this lives. journey. Uh, lives, of course, being put into this this journey. For it to end all in two for, days, all for this yeah. complete disaster. And in reality, you know, the the fate was really decided 
in about kind of the first half hour yeah. um, of that battle where it really became clear that this was going to be one-sided and the rest almost was just an exercise in finishing off the enemy um, and it meant that Japan was catapulted into like the position of the leading power oh yeah in the Pacific I mean people people were not expecting this no it was a big shock you know it was the first time a European power had been defeated by an Asian power almost yeah, well really kind of any non-European power yeah non-Western power, if you like, if you want to include America, had been defeated um, in a major conflict by a supposedly kind of inferior um, nation. Mm -hmm. And not just anyone, the mighty Russian Empire. Yeah. I mean, it re really made people kind of pay attention and, and say, now, hang on a minute, these are not someone to mess with. I mean, uh, it, it, the light uh, viewed on the Japanese like completely changed after this. And I mean, the Battle of Tsushima, that was... I mean, not only was it the first, uh, like you mentioned, the first battle involving steel battleships, um, but it also was a battle which kind of would decide... Well, the way that naval battles were, were fought for <laughs> quite, a, quite a while... Yeah, it had a huge influence on the world in terms of like naval decision makers because yeah. it was it was shocking and a lot of the kind of designs used by the Russian other navies realized, hang on, we can't do that. Um, and the dominance of the kind of big guns mm -hmm. influenced the move really towards um, the dreadnought style battleship, which was focused all on big guns. So it had a massive impact on kind of naval history, and it really, you know, Asian history in the sense that this was really obviously celebrated in Japan as yeah. a stunning victory, and as you know, the, the fact it was so one-sided had a huge effect on Japan and the way Japan kind of viewed its military and its kind of ambitions. Um, Russia lost. I mean, it arguably is the most decisive, the most one-sided naval battle in history. L Russia lost all eight battleships that had been sent to the Far East. Mm -hmm. um, they had they lost twenty-one vessels sunk, seven captured, six interned, um, five thousand Russian sailors killed, about nine thousand captured, many many wounded. All this compared to the Japanese who lost three torpedo boats sank hmm. no battleships whatsoever no you know capital ships at all yeah and this is the most stunning statistic for me the japanese lost 117 dead 583 wounded compared to 5000 russian dead that is amazing i mean yeah i think you're right i think that probably is the most one-sided naval battle in history and it means the Japanese kind of their ambitions become unbounded in their yeah I suppose hubris around their own capabilities is is stoked and uh -huh. obviously going to have very negative consequences um, in the decades to come Indeed. both for Japan and for the region in terms of you know the wars that are unleashed in the Pacific yeah, and that has a lot to do with this battle and the fact that it seems to show that the Japanese are invincible, that they are superior particularly to the Western powers mm -hmm. you know there's a real kind of complex of look we took on the Russians and won we don't need to be afraid anymore of the Britons and the Americas of this world yeah um, I find it very interesting to also think about the fact that just several decades before this, the Japanese were basically completely closed. They were a, com a completely closed country. And the amount of rapid militarization that they did in that amount of time that could lead 
to something like this just astounds me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of... um, It is a shock to the world, and it is a shock to to Russia, and it is a shock, I'd probably say, the Japanese were surprised at the scale of the success. Togo, I think, wrote something along the lines of these battleships that take years to build but can disappear in half an hour. I think he was stunned because, like I said, there hadn't been a major fleet battle for a hundred years. Nobody really knew what was going to happen and what the effect would be. Um, interestingly, um, Rosovetsky was captured. Mm. Uh, the destroyer he was on was was captured. A Japanese destroyer caught up with it. The the commander, the captain, jumped aboard with a sword and said, "This ship is now under my command." Mm-hmm. And uh, was stunned to find that this kind of slipping in and out of a coma, the Russian admiral was below decks. Uh, but he actually recovered. Um, hmm. And Togo visited him in hospital and praised him on his kind of honor and uh, bravery. Um, said, uh, defeat is a common fate of a soldier. There is nothing to be ashamed of. The only question is whether or not we have performed our duty Mm. Now, whether or not we can say Rosovetsky did so, giving we arguing he presided over the most disastrous voyage in history, yeah, um, is by the by. But um, he actually kind of got away with it. Um, he, he, you know, as I say, survived. Unlike an awful lot of his, um, and unlike an awful lot of his his crews, mm. um, and he made it back to Russia although apparently on the long voyage home there was a mutant yeah. of the Russian crews who'd been prisoners who rioted, broke into his cabin and demanded vodka <laughs> and threatened the man who spilt our blood, so one final kind of <laughs> footnote in the most disastrous voyage um, now I guess our focus has been on Russia because this is Russia's most disastrous voyage um, they were the ones who undertook it so unsurprisingly back home people had to be called to account mm-hmm. now Rosesvensky perhaps because he was the Tsar's favourite perhaps because he was so badly wounded was kind of acquitted right. and given a generous pension um, but Nebogatov and three captains from the fleet um were sentenced um, they were sentenced to execution wow um, but it was commuted um, to 10 years in prison mm-hmm. which is is still you know it's still significant certainly I think especially for Nebogatov I, mean, yeah. I don't think he really did much wrong well, yeah, well surrendering con- what was left of the fleet was yeah. considered a- yeah and considering the fact that he didn't even realize that he was the head admiral <laughs> essentially yeah. uh, of until until hours later hours later I mean um, and I think you know his surrendering of the remnants of the fleet was an act of mercy yeah to I mean, be honest to right. save the lives of the rest of his crew yeah given that the battle was certainly lost one final um, disaster if we like in this long story Mm. Um, Rosesvensky lived another four years um, in retirement Mm. Um, but (laughs) one final disaster in July 1908 the Russian Admiralty announced um a requiem service to be held for him to mm. remember him um, but he wasn't dead <laughs> <laughs> um, and yet again I'll, I'll ask how did this happen and I guess it just is one final kind of um, one final note of incompetence from a deeply deeply incompetent navy <laughs> Oh wow! When did uh, Rosasvensky die? Uh, four years after the battle, so nineteen oh nine, I believe. All uh, right. They were just a little bit early. Just a little bit early, yes. Wow. Well, what what a story. 
It is a remarkable story. We covered 18,000 miles. We did. I feel like I need a rest after that. I Yeah, definitely. I need to dock in Vladivostok. And uh, yeah, well, good luck getting there. You have to pass through the Straits <laughs> of Tsushima. Turn your lights off. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. Forget, um, the, forget the rules of war. Just turn them off. But yeah, I'd be fascinated if our listeners can suggest a more disastrous voyage in history. Mm, um, yeah. This one. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm you know, trying. Five thousand deaths. <laughs> I'm struggling and to think. Everything wrong that we can, that we have recounted over the last two episodes. Yeah, I mean, they 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 fell off the ladder and hit every rung on the way down. Um, it's 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 hard to think. It's hard to top that. It really is. It really is. But um, it's been a real pleasure telling you this story. And it's been a pleasure hearing it uh, very much. Uh, and I hope our, our, our listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I'm sure they found both comedy and tragedy yes. in that story, which in a way, you know, that's the best stories, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. A comedy of errors, I think, is a, another way of, of Definitely. thinking about it. Um, many, many errors. Um, some, some were not in control of them but some were yeah i mean we've got to feel a little bit sorry yeah i mean yeah we can't we can't do we can't do it you know we can't dog. just laugh you know we have to do we have to to feel a little sorry for the and mad those dog. sailors you know yeah and the sailors of course they did their best but a real a real horrible situation to be in yeah well that has been history's most episode three History's Most Disastrous Voyage, Part 2, The Battle of Tsushima. Um, Again, email us at histories.most at gmail.com if you have any suggestions. If you can come up with uh, anything more disastrous than this, let us know. We'd love to hear them. We'd love to read them out. Indeed. Um, We'd love to hear... Anything that you have to say, any comments, any suggestions, uh, follow us on Twitter at History's Most. And we're, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. If you enjoy it as much as us, um, it would be really helpful if you could leave a review on iTunes, on sorry, on the Apple Podcast app, or wherever you kind of get your podcasts. Spread the word on social media. Um, just you know, let us know. Yeah, what we're doing well, what we could do better. You know, we want to improve. We want to yeah keep this going. Yeah, we want to we want to keep going. We we got a lot more stories to tell. We certainly do. Well, until next time, I have been Peter, and I've been Alex, and you've been listening to History's Most. <laughs>